When it comes to the defining aspects of the 1980s, you may think of hair bands, spandex, maybe Madonna. But me, even though I'm a Philly boy, I think of the Larry Bird era. In 13 seasons, he led the Celtics to five NBA finals, three NBA championships, picking up three MVP awards along the way. And a regular fixture for nearly four years? Boston Globe sports writer Dan Shaughnessy, long before the NBA was a billion-dollar industry, with players taking private jets, staying in five-star hotels, reporters were granted close access, flying commercial alongside the stars, staying in the same hotels, hanging out at the same bars as they traveled the country. And Shaughnessy's put all he learned from Celtics giants like Bird, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, Cedric Maxwell, and Bill Walton in his great new book, Wish It Lasted Forever, Life with Larry Bird Celtics. Dan joins me now. Dan, congratulations. Good to see you. Thanks, Jim. Good to see you. Let's make clear up front, this is not a sports book about basketball. It's a book about a bunch of men who play team basketball better than anybody else on the planet. That's a fair summary, is it not? Yeah, I think so. Everybody knows who won the games. It's old stuff. You know, we get that Hall of Fame, the stats, all that. This is kind of a, a view inside the, the greatness and, and guys who were securing the greatness and understood the team concept in, a, in an age when we could tell you, the fans, what they were like. That's what this is. The universal truths are here. Can you describe the access the Globe reporter who covers the Celtics today has compared to what you had in the mm -hmm. 80s? Jim, the moat has gotten very wide. I mean, it was already <laughs> wide. You know, again, the teams travel separately. They're on charter aircraft. No one is allowed inside the loop. They stay in five-star hotels. We certainly don't do that. The lowly media, we don't sit near them during the games. We used to be right next to the bench. Now they sell those seats. I understand that. Uh, yeah, we were like on the team, except not having the fame and the glory and, and the money and all that stuff. But now there's a big separation. The reporters really can't tell you what... Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Marcus Smart alike, who likes who, if they like the new coach. It's hard to do that now, nobody's fault. Just the way it's evolved, there's none of that access. And of course, with COVID, the abundance of caution now, yeah. they're kicked out of the locker room, no one's near anybody anymore. You know, speaking of up close and personal, it's hard to pick my favorite up close and personal story from the book, but I will. The notion that Dan Shaughnessy is in a foul shooting competition you know. with Larry Burt for money. Can you describe how that came about? Well, he was, he always liked money and he always liked taking our money at practice. You know, you'd walk into the gym, he called it shoot for money. He'd be standing there with the ball, 30 feet from the hoop, he'd say, dollar? If you agreed, <laughs> if he made it, you gave him a dollar. If he missed it, he gave you a dollar. It was just, it was all about him, the pool hustle aspect of growing up poor in rural Southern Indiana. So this carried over and they had a practice one day during the playoffs in 85. He was taping his hand in a web. He had a busted up hand. I said, you can't play in a game with your hand taped up like that. He called me Scoop. He said, Scoop, I could make, I could tape my whole hand, make more shots than you. And he had done this before, I think, because it was very calculated. He said, 100 free throws, $5 a throw. We'll see who can shoot free throws with tape on his hand. And he taped his hand up like a fist, like a gloved fist. He was shot putting them. He made 86 out of 100. I was choking seeing $5 bills flying through the air. And I lost $160. Thank you very much. How much was he making at the time? Do you know? Oh my God, it was it was over a million then, which was like kind of astronomical. So yeah, he's got over a hundred million dollars in the bank. And Jim, if you run into Larry Bird at any point, say, how much money did you take off Scoop Shaughnessy in 1985? He'll say, I got $160 in my pocket from Scoop Shaughnessy. <laughs> you know, you mentioned he's from rural, I think you said Southern Indiana. The conventional wisdom on Bird is brilliant on the court, not so much so, sort of the, the hick from French Lick. That's wrong, isn't it? Correct. I mean, Bob Ryan once described him as willfully uneducated. I think that's that's fair. And again, he had street smarts. He was smart then. He's smart now. He understood the dynamic between reporters and athletes. He understood his popularity, trying to keep people at bay. He was very funny. He was back and forth. And again, once he trusted you and knew you a little bit, it was pretty hilarious. Why did Robert Parrish hate you? No one knows. It was just right from the jump, 1982 on. And I, I asked Cedric Maxwell 37 years later, Max, 
what was up with the chief? Why didn't he like me? He said, chief just had a disdain for your ass. And I mean, you can't argue with that logic. <laughs> disdain for your ass. So uh, they were not only the best ever in 85, 86, according to most observers, not just you, but also the whitest ever. Maybe not ever, but at least in the last yeah. 50 years. I think there were eight white players, four black players. Was that an issue with any of the players? I know you're right, it was an issue with the fans, even fans in Boston. Was it an issue with the, with the players? There was a little bit of an issue in the last cuts we made that year. I talked to Dennis Johnson. He was a little hurt by it. He was closer to Carlos Clark and David Thirdkill. One of the guys got cut. They kept Rick Carlisle, who's now coach of the – he was Dallas Mavericks. I guess he's Pacers now. But um, And there was some a little bit of tension about that. But Red Auerbach always insulated himself on this stuff. Red Auerbach was the first man in the NBA to, to, to draft a black player, first to hire a black you know, coach in, in, the, in basketball, Bill Russell. First to start five black players when no one else would do it. And the coach of the 84, excuse me, of the 85, 86 Celtics was Casey Jones, an African-American man. So Casey picked the team, said, these are my guys. And when you win the championship and go 50 and one at home, the complexion of the roster really means nothing at that point. You got the best team. We, uh, by the way, you can put up a picture. I think we have a picture of Auerbach and Russell hugging on from your book on mm -hmm. uh, Bill Russell night. Maxwell, Cedric Maxwell, look at look at the size of them. Uh, uh, Maxwell didn't mm -hmm. think white guys could play till he met these guys, right? Max is hilarious, I and mean, he comes off the page in this book. I mean, he told me when he was in college, North Carolina, Charlotte, they would tell him the scouting report, the upcoming opponent, and he would say, "Just tell me one thing: is the guy white or black? Because if he's white, I'm not worried about this guy." <laughs> And he said, God's a funny God. I come to the NBA and God gives me not only the greatest white player, the two greatest white players of their generation at the side, side by side, Larry Bird and Kevin McHale. So Max had his doubts. He had, you know, it passed the test and they, they proved to him they could play. And to this day, uh, he understands that. But he's very good on this topic, you know, living in Boston at a time mm -hmm. he came here in the late 70s, a lot going on with Boston with racial tensions at that time. And Max has a good grasp of this, and there's a lot of good Max stuff in this book about that. There is, by the way, that photograph, in addition to Maxwell, was obviously Abdul Jabbar and Magic Johnson. Mm. You know, I may be reading too much into this, and you may ridicule me for this, but is there a moral mm. to this story beyond just the great story for those of us who like to think we work as a team, even if not at the same level in whatever we do as these guys? Or am I reading too much into it? No, Jim, I think that's fair. It comes out at the end when Bruce Hurst, the baseball player for the Red Sox, goes to practice. He was friends with Danny Ainge, and he points out the difference between these Celtic great players and the Red Sox great players. They had Jim Rice. They had Roger Clemens. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of great players. He said, we were insecure. We, we competed with each other. We weren't necessarily rooting for each other. These guys, they were about themselves. They were about each other, and they were not petty or jealous about who got the most touches, the most shots, the most money. They were secure in their own greatness. They took criticism well. They tease each other. Practices were joyous. And this is a universal truth. If you're a coach, if you're an athlete, this is the kind of level you want to achieve to have a group of guys who get beyond the selfishness of the normal competition that you have even within your own team and go for the greater good. Red Auerbach created that. He had a team full of guys who could do that. And those truths, they live forever. And fun does matter. Dan Shaughnessy, love the book. Congratulations. Good to see you. Big thanks, Jim.